on the stage, they just scared I'ma kill We bring the king to the world, dog. I don't even stress Act town maybe, don't back down and they hate me Rock up on the please This is The Connect, and this is our very first episode And I am super stoked, I'm super excited We've been praying, we've been just strategizing We've been studying and doing all kinds of different things And tonight is the night And tonight is our very first episode And I'm so excited to have one of my good friends Not only just as a sister in the Lord But a, a, a co-laborer in the gospel and in ministry And it's my good friend, Miss Christina Boudreaux Thanks for having me I'm super so, excited to be here I'm so stoked that you're here, man. And I, you know, I was I was thinking about how I wanted to do this and I was thinking about who I should get first. And even Sophia will tell you while I was thinking about it and praying, I was like, man, dude, I I just gotta get Christina out here first. Yes, and so I I'm so excited. And so Thank for, for having me. For some of you that kind of don't know what's going on with this show, um, this is basically just a place where you can connect with us. Um, it's like a conversation that we're having with you, um, obviously with different topics, life issues, um, all in light of the Bible. So you're going to be hearing some stuff tonight that is just straight based off of scripture. And so tonight I have my special guest, Christina here. I'm so excited that she's here. I'm going to interview her, but I'm also, we're going to get into the topic of singleness, mm -hmm dating and relationships some of your guys's favorite topics out there come with questions y'all come with questions yeah and yes. so if you if you guys see right there in the uh, comment section or in the section on the top we're gonna have a q a at the end so if you have any questions just write it in the comment section mm -hmm. and we'll get to your questions at the end of tonight's show so let's begin awesome no, I'm just kidding. That's too cheesy. <laughs> Anyways, so Christina, mm -hmm. you are an author. Mm -hmm. You are, first off, you're a Christian. Yes. Okay. You are an author. Mm -hmm. You're a public speaker. Yes. Right? And you are a youth leader, mm -hmm. correct? And you are also an artist. You do spoken word yes. and, yeah. right? Yeah. And you're also a YouTuber, right? You yeah, like, yeah, I've done some videos. <laughs> no, I don't really care about following, but um, I do videos to encourage people. So, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I just wanted to ask you first, how, mm -hmm. how did you come mm -hmm. to faith in Christ? Like, what is your backstory up until that point where you finally decided this is what I want to do? So I grew up in church my whole life. You know, mm -hmm. I grew up going to Harvest, Greg Boy's church. I went there for elementary school. I went there for... Um, for church and school. And I remember, you know, you know, seeing altar calls from the time I was younger, my family, you know, served at Harvest Crusades. And I remember, um, you know, when I gave my heart to the Lord, I was six years old, you know, I was at a Harvest Crusade. My parents were, um, they were serving. And I remember mm -hmm. like, I don't, I remember hearing the gospel over and over again, you know, but I felt like on that day, I felt God's love just like draw me and I was I remember looking at my dad being like dad I want to go down I want to go down and wow. receive the Lord and he just was like okay you know and I remember kind of praying the prayer that a lot of us pray but I pray I felt like in that moment it was like real to me mm -hmm. and so I went down and um that was the day that I really received the Lord and I felt like I really understood salvation and mm -hmm. what God did for me on the cross so yeah wow so how old were you I was six. Six years old. Yeah. Wow. That just shatters everyone's age of accountability doctrine right now. Because mm -hmm. even at six years old, yeah. you can make the conscious decision yeah. to put your faith in Jesus and repent Absolutely. of your sins. And that, yeah. that that's an amazing thing because yeah. there really is no age limit. Yeah, there isn't. Because if an individual can make mm -hmm. that decision, that's yeah. their own personal decision. Yeah, so, absolutely. I also wanted to ask you, so... You became a Christian when you were six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So between you were, when you were six years old and I would say maybe junior high mm -hmm. and high school, wh how was that for you? Were, were there yeah. things that you struggled with? Were there things yeah. that you began to um, discover about mm -hmm. yourself that wasn't right? Like how, yeah. how was, how was your, I guess, how was your experience as a teenager and a preteen? Yeah. So, um, I was the kid in youth group who dealt with everything, you know, <laughs> who struggled so much with, um, you know, my identity, you know, I grew up just in a, in a, um, environment where there's a lot of trauma, you know, like sexual abuse and 
physical and emotional abuse and a lot of this stuff. And I remember like it damaging me so much. And so it really, Mm. um, began to skew just my, like, I knew that, that God loved me and I knew that God was my father, but I really struggled with, um, just my identity in the Lord, you know, because I would see people at church and their lives were so good, you know, and they didn't struggle with anything, but I was the kid that struggled. And so Mm. I had the belief like, God, you must love me less because I'm struggling, you know, with depression in the fifth grade, because I'm struggling with eating disorders in middle school, because I'm struggling, you know, with even thoughts of wanting to kill myself into high school, you know? And, um, even with that, a lot of it, I felt like my journey with God from the time, you know, when I first said yes to him up until now has really been a journey of struggling with different things, but really Mm. understanding Christina, your identity was never found in, what people said about you, how you were treated, how good your life is or isn't is like my, your identity is solely founded on what I did for you on the cross Mm -hmm. and who you are as my kid. And so, yeah, that's kind of been my journey with that. So if you don't mind me asking, what, what would you say, um, was maybe one of the one weaknesses that you, obviously saw when you were a preteen teenager yeah. that God has absolutely just taught you how to not only, you know, conquer that, but to yeah. live through that mm-hmm. with him. Like if, if you want to share. Yeah. Um, I would say the biggest thing for me, like being like in junior high and high school was my battle with eating disorders. Mm-hmm. And what I realized is that eating disorders, you know, I dealt with anorexia and bulimia and bulimia was a disease of approval, you mm. know, like I didn't know my identity and my worth. And so I would starve myself, you know, I would throw up my food. I would do all these things because I believed that that was my ticket to acceptance. Wow. And when I had an encounter with God, when I was 18 years old, um, I was about to turn 18, my sen- senior year of my, um, of high school. And I remember God did a radical work in my heart where he completely healed me that night of eating disorders. But that night, what he reminded me of was Christina, you always did these things because you wanted to be loved and accepted the basic need of every human being and the basic longing. But when you said yes to me, when you were six years old Mm -hmm. and you became my child, my acceptance and love was always there for you. So regardless of what people do, that was always there. And I think it was the love and acceptance of God that healed me more than anything else. That's that. I'm glad that you brought that up because I have identified that with a lot of people that put their faith in Jesus, Mm -hmm. there's this thing that happens where sometimes psychologically or even mentally it's, people believe or they just think or convince themselves that they will never struggle with something ever again or have some kind of weakness or have, whether it's sin or whether it's just a mental thing or whatever it may be. And I found that that condemns people. Like when you become a Christian and it's very evident that a war breaks out within your heart, like the flesh against the spirit and it's just going at it with each other. It's very evident that you begin to see things going on within yourself that need to be corrected, that God wants to help you with. But I think a lot of young girls, especially, um, that are discovering this as well, even as Christians, baby Christians, that they still have weaknesses, but they still condemn themselves because they feel like they have to be strong, but they're obviously not. And they're afraid to come out and they're afraid to even express, this is what's wrong with me. And I feel like I have to put up this front, whatever that may be, it could be anything, in order so people can think that I'm okay and that I'm strong. Yeah. And even Andrew, um, even just speaking into that, you know, like uh, for a lot of my friends out there, um, you know, I came into our time of prayer today, you know, with Andrew and Sophia and, you know, especially people, you know, like our age, you know, like we're in ministry, you know, we're serving the Lord, you know. We've walked with God for so many years that people have this belief that you will never struggle with things, that you will never get attacked by the enemy with things. But, you know, you guys, last week I was in Nevada for a week, you know, at a sex trafficking recovery home in Nevada. Mm -hmm. And God did amazing things, you know. And I was like, it was such a beautiful week. I drove home Sunday from Nevada. And yesterday and today, um, I was battling with anxiety Mm -hmm. and just really feeling like, 
like, God, like, what's wrong, you know? And it was just, and I had, you know, my church leadership team praying for me. But what I realized is that even though I was battling anxiety, that that anxiety wasn't my identity, you know, that I was a child of God and that I was loved. And today, you know, I played worship music. Yeah. I looked up Bible verses on the the peace of God, the love of God. And I was reciting those Bible verses, you know, and mm-hmm. I had a time of just worship with the Lord. And I realized that as Christians, it's okay, you know, no matter where we are in our walk with God to say, hey, I'm struggling. Yep with anxiety, with fear, you know, with depression, whatever yeah. your struggle is, and that it's okay because God loves us. And so many of us want to put up that front that we're okay, yeah. but God's house is a hospital. Absolutely. And a lot of us are sitting in God's hospital wounded, but the physician's like, hey, <laughs> yeah, why could you be honest with me with what I already know about? And it's freeing when we don't feel like we need to have it together. Yeah. And it's yeah. an absolute mark and growth Yeah, uh, of a mark of growth and maturity. Yeah. Because when an individual can learn, like Paul did, yeah. that in my weaknesses, I am made strong. Yes. That becomes a reality, not by a snap of God's fingers. But as you go on in life, Paul yes. had to learn that. That was a process of, if you read that in context, he's yeah. like, dude, I went through this. I went through that. Mm-hmm. I had um, I had a near-death experience. I know of yeah. a man that was taken into the third heaven, dude. Like, yeah, you know, and that's how he learned that yeah. in my weaknesses, mm-hmm. his strength is made perfect. And Absolutely. I think a lot, I think a lot of young people struggle with the fact that Christianity isn't about God snapping his fingers yeah. and everything will go away. And, you, you know, you may not want to hear that, um, but God can do that. Absolutely. But at the same time, we are living. Mm-hmm. We still live in a fallen world. Bad things are going to happen. And yeah. we have spiritual defects Absolutely. that God wants to teach us how to mature yeah. through those things. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very essential for an individual to understand that and to accept that. Yeah. That it's not going to be like this forever. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a bold statement. Yeah. And what I mean by that is an eternal value where mm-hmm. if I'm suffering with something, yeah. I could suffer. Mm-hmm. But I know that if I die and I walk into eternity with Christ, I will forever be healed for Absolutely. the rest of my eternal life. Yeah. And that comes with maturity to get yeah. to that point. I'm not saying mm-hmm. I've attained or anything, but yeah. when you read the Bible, it's very mm-hmm. significant. It's very It pinpoints suffering. Yeah. Yeah. And so I also wanted to ask you as well, so when you got out of high school or when you when you became a young adult Mm -hmm. okay um when did you start doing ministry like when when because what you're doing now with you know guest speaking and different Mm -hmm. things going on like when how did how did you get started with that yeah so um when I was 18 years old you know I was a freshman at UC Riverside Mm -hmm. and um I remember just I had a lot of people in my life that had, that had expectation for me on Christina. This is what you need to do with your life. But I had an encounter with God, you know, like yeah, a year yeah. before where God radically healed me and saved me from eating disorders, you know, cutting depression and suicide. And I remember that night saying, Lord, I was the blind man who was once lost. And now I see wherever Jesus of Nazareth, wherever you go, like I will follow you. Yeah. And I recognized that my life wasn't my own. So I remember just sitting with God on my school campus and saying, what is it that you want me to do for the rest of my life? Because I have no other plans except your plans. And the Lord spoke so clearly to me, like, you're going to teach my word for Mm -hmm. the rest of your life. And when I was 18 years old, honestly, just through, um, I remember going to Loma Linda for for rehab, you know, when I was uh, 16 years old in high school. And, you know, they... I was still connected with people there. So they just began to hear about, you know, my story of overcoming stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. I was involved in a church, you know, where they would be like, Hey, can you share your testimony? You know, or can you share like on this radio thing? Can you share on this TV thing? And so there was all of these avenues that God just began to open doors. And it was just started out as like, here I am, God send me. Mm -hmm. But what I recognized is that God was less concerned about, Uh, me walking in a calling and more concerned about my character. And so he began to open these small doors and say, will you be faithful at this? But most of my, I spent five years at UC Riverside. Mm -hmm. Most of my five years at school would me be, would like, like 
involve me being like in the library for hours at a time, just reading God's word. So, you know, we had amazing grass fields at our school under trees and I just would have time of prayer. And my college years was really about me drawing closer to the Lord, you know, reading books, going to conferences and getting equipped, Mm -hmm. sitting under discipleship. And so it started then, like God just was like, okay, you did this. Now I'm going to open this door and this door. And I would tell people, they'd be like, what do you want to do with your life? And I'm like, you know what? I feel like I'm supposed to write books. Mm. I'm called to share God's word, uh, wherever that is. And they're like, well, how is that going to happen? And I was like, I don't know. God's going to do it. You know, yeah. they, people thought it was crazy. But um, now that I'm walking in it, I knew that it was only something God could do. And it's something that only he could do now. Mm-hmm. And he still does now. Yeah. So, yeah. So you are the founder of I Am Royalty? Yeah. So how did that start? So I Am Royalty started... um, And what is I Am Royalty? Yeah, so I Am Royalty is a young women's ministry that I founded in 2012. And we also help oversee the Power of Purity Conference that happens every year at the Calvary Chapel Conference Center with On the Edge Ministries. Mm -hmm. And I started I Am Royalty as really um, something where I was like, God, like, there's a lot of you know, examples in this world for young girls, you know, but, um, they're like the wrong examples, you know, of like purity, you know, beauty and all this stuff. But I am royalty, you know, the mission statement is, you know, reconciling the daughters to the father and it is a message of identity and helping Mm. girls understand their worth and beauty and value in God's eyes. And so a lot of it has been events we've hosted, you know, for group home girls going into the homes of girls, who had been rescued from human trafficking, um, you know, guest speaking, doing, you know, blogs and um, just doing different stuff, you know. And so that um, even though sometimes, you know, when I go into places like I don't promote I'm royalty at all, I'm just like, hey, this is just kind of the umbrella, you know, that we go under. But, you know, my overseeing pastor, Rod Thompson, kind of oversees what I do. But um, sometimes I forget (laughs) that it's (laughs) like I'm real because I don't go as I go in the name of Christ, you know, more than in the name of a ministry. Mm And, um, yeah, so that's how it started. Wow. Yeah. So how, how has, how has God been using, um, everything? Like if you could like take a look at your past, right? Yeah. And sometimes I love to do this. Yeah. I think it's good and healthy to mm-hmm. look at your past in light of everything that God has done for you and brought you out of. Yeah. What would you say right now is where are you right now? Mm-hmm. I know it's a personal question. Yeah. But. Cause we just talked about a lot yeah. that that's, that's like real life, bro. Like going yeah. through crazy things like that. Like we don't just say that lightly, you yeah. know, like, you know, eating disorders and, and identity mm-hmm. crisis and stuff like that, yeah. that that's like hardcore stuff. Like we just yeah. say that, but when you look back, mm-hmm. where are you now? Like how has God absolutely, um, matured you mm-hmm. in light of those things that you yeah. used to struggle with? Yeah. So I, th- I feel like the biggest thing, like, where I am right now, you know, um, just to kind of illustrate it, like, I, w- I took a trip to Montana last year in October um, to share at a ministry school called Potter's Field Ministries, mm-hmm. and um, my companion was all traveled the United States and do a message of, like, pottery and a clay, but when I was there, the message of the potter and the clay resonated mm-hmm. so deeply with me, and what I realized more than anything else, because, you know, as a believer and as we walk with the Lord and do ministry— sometimes ministry can become a place where we find our identity, you know, a place where, you know, everyone is just trying to look like they have it together because if you don't, well, maybe you're not qualified to do ministry, you know? And I remember seeing a message where the, where, you know, pastor Mike had this hardened piece of clay and he's like, this is a picture of many people that they, that their hearts have grown hardened, you know, that they have become prideful, that they are relying so much on their own strength and he smashed it. And he was like, this is where God wants us to be Mm. broken before him, undone before him, vulnerable before him. And God took me in a season probably since before I went to Potter's Field, like in April of last year, where a week before I went to the Philippines, I said, God, break me. And God took like that piece of clay in my life and was just like, we're going to start over. Wow. And he broke me so deeply. And it was a place where it was like everything I had ever placed my identity in. He stripped, Mm. not so much where he took it away from me, but he brought me to such a place of brokenness where even last year, November and December, he said, sit with me. Wow. No ministry, just Sundays, sit. And it was like no modeling industry for me because I've done plus size modeling, mm-hmm. no speaking, no writing. Um, 
nothing. And God took me like that piece of, cause like the Lord showed me, like, even with, um, the potter and the clay, you know, that we are just the dust, Mm -hmm. like the clay dirt. And it's only when the water hits it, the water of God's word and spirit that, that, that that dust becomes clay Mm. and God took me to such a place where he reminded me Christina always stay as a piece of clay in my hands Mm. that is willing to be moldable by me that is what that is yielded to me submitted to me and surrendered to me and so what I see now in my life is that everything God asked me to do is that he says okay I have this for you so he molds me to that vessel for that purpose and he uses me and then he breaks me back down to that piece of clay. Mm-hmm. And what God's shown me is Christina, cause there's doors that will open for us, you know, whatever it is, but he's shown me like, do not be a part of work that my hand is not upon. Yeah. And so the biggest thing that God's brought me in this season is to a place of brokenness Yeah. because when we're broken is when we understand who we are, you know, as that piece of clay in the potter's hands mm-hmm. and realizing that no matter what I do with my life, that my identity is always found in my potter's hands. Yeah. And so that message of just identity and my intimacy with the Lord and being broken before him mm-hmm. has been the greatest desire of my heart. And the greatest desire of my life is not ministry. Yeah. Um, it's just being with Jesus, yeah. you know? And so that has kind of been the season that I've been in and kind of the anthem, you know, mm-hmm. of my life. People are like, "How? why are you posting for the fifth time this week about the potter and the clay? And I'm like, it's everything. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah, like that's, yeah. you know, he's everything and that's where it's at. So, yeah. Yeah. That's where I'm at. I, I wanted to touch on this. Yeah. Since we're here. Yeah. Um, if you take a look at the Bible. Yeah. And you see every man, every woman they have all come to a place or they came to a place in their life of absolute just brokenness. Yes, yeah. You take a look at Nehemiah. The guy was weeping over Jerusalem. Yeah. You take a look at uh, Moses. Um, He he literally lost everything. He forsook everything and goes into the desert for 40 years and then God utilizes him and sends him to go do what he was called Mm -hmm. to do. And Paul was yeah. was scourged he he came to near death experiences this was a broken broken man yeah but ultimately you look at Jesus yeah and think about this okay this is going to be deep all right yeah when you think about Jesus yeah. and you think about an individual who's called yeah you know that Jesus was called to literally walk the death sentence on the cross yeah. in roman culture okay yeah And so when you think about what he did, when he walked it, he did it, he lived it, he executed it according to the Father's will, the most excruciating pain, dying, hanging on the cross. And I don't say this lightly. Literally ripped to shreds, hanging on the cross. The most ultimate suffering a human being could possibly ever endure. That's literally torture. Yeah. Okay? That according to the Bible, was the, the epicenter of mm. God's gift to the world. Yeah. At the most epic suffering that the Son of God could have ever endured or come to, mm. hanging and bleeding on the cross, that's, that's, the, that's the gift that God has given to the world of salvation. Mm. And a lot of people um, don't want to experience suffering. They think mm. that suffering is something that God... Um, is doing to them because he doesn't love them or he hates them. No, God God works through suffering. He yeah. does his most monumental masterpieces. He does his most monumental works mm-hmm. in the midst of suffering. Yeah. And that takes maturity to understand. Yeah. Because if I'm honest, when I first got involved with ministry, like doing a campus ministry, preaching the gospel at secular high schools, I was, as a born-again Christian, that was probably my peak of mm-hmm. dealing with depression. Yeah. And I had to come to a place where I was either, I, I am going to follow Jesus if I suffer with this for the rest of my life. I will still follow you and I will mm-hmm. still serve you with all that I have, even if, if I suffer with this for the rest of my life. And it was at that point that, like you're saying, that point of brokenness where you are just shattered mm-hmm. as a human being is when God picks you up and he fills you with his spirit and he begins to use you in such a way that you're invisible 
to yourself and to the world and he begins to use you like a glove his hand you're just his glove absolutely and so i wanted i wanted to hit on that because i think there are a lot of people christina dude like a lot of young kids that have so much stuff going on suffering depression whether it's anxiety or eating disorders and they feel like that counts them out of maybe even being a christian or even being used by god when you get bold and you're just like, I don't even care. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to do this. I, I am going to go for this. By faith, I'm broken. I'm shattered. I know who you are. I'm going to go forward mm-hmm. and watch what God does. Yeah. I, I think something special happens when an individual takes their brokenness. They're just pouring it out to Jesus every yeah. day, every night, but they still follow him yeah. and allow him to use them. Yeah. It's pretty deep stuff. Yeah. But, you know, and, and, and if you're out there right now, dude, like, God God loves you. Mm-hmm. Like, more than... I always tell the kids in our youth group this. Like, when you when you look at creation, God created the, the universe, right? Mm-hmm. But he also created mankind. Yeah. But I always tell the kids this, that God didn't create the universe with the same intent that he created mankind with. Yeah. Because God doesn't love the universe. God loves the world. He loves people. He created us for relationship. Yeah. And I think people, they have this perception of themselves where they are just like an object. Yeah. They're just something instead of an individual that God loves so much. You're not just like, you know, the moon. You're, you're not the ocean. You're not a, a beautiful masterpiece that God has created. There's a separation between God's creation and the universe mm-hmm. and God's creation of mankind. He loves people. Mm-hmm. God doesn't love the moon. No. You know what I mean? Like God loves you and me mm-hmm. and you. Like he loves you so much. You have, yeah. you have no idea, but it's all found in who Jesus is. Yeah. Yeah. And even... You know, to speak into that, I know that we live in a, in a generation, you know, with so many kids. I know that, you know, with you and Sophia, you know, you guys go to these high schools and you see so many kids, you know, in junior high and high school. And even people as they get older, like, you know, college, young adult and all throughout their lives where people are constantly masking their brokenness. Yeah. You know, people are really good at playing a role of even, you know hiding behind, you know, a ministry position or a gifting or a hobby or their social media, whatever it is that people hide behind now. And it's exhausting, you guys, you know, it's exhausting wearing those masks. And what God showed me recently was like, it was almost just like an image he put in my heart of like all of these masks I've worn throughout my life and just putting them in a pile and just burning them, you know, and just realizing that that was like, like an aroma to the Lord because um, he showed me like Christina, like when you wear a mask of any kind, it hides who I made you to be. Yeah. And when we know our identity in Christ and who God made us to be, like, I remember like recently God was like, Christina, like this was a couple weeks ago. He's like, write down who you are in me. And I was like, God, I know that you've made me to be like bold mm. and brave and passionate, you know, and, and just, you know, creative and all these things. And I was like, I like who you made me to be is so amazing. Like why would I want to wear a mask? And I think that just comes from knowing our identity in the Lord. And as we know our identity in the Lord, when we're broken, we don't have to cover it. We can just be like, Hey, um, because our like brokenness doesn't become our identity, you know? And I think that's where a lot of people are like, you know, like I'm eating disordered. I'm a cutter. I'm depressed, but no, you're a child of God, but you're just dealing with those things. And so even, you know, just the last couple days, I realized like, you know what? I'm a child of God. I'm still, you know, creative, bold, brave, you know, out there, whatever it is. Um, but I'm just struggling with anxiety right now. Yeah. But that type of brokenness, I was able to come before my church leadership by texting them today, my pastors, my leaders, our elders and deacons, and just being like, hey, pray for me. And people were texting me, Christina, we love you. We're fighting for you. And there's so much freedom when we can go unmask, unmask, you know, and expose our brokenness and be vulnerable because it, it robs the world and it robs us, you know, when we, when we mask those things and we put up walls, you know. Yeah. And I would say do that with safe people. Yep. You know, those people in my life were safe people. Don't blast it on social media. You're going to get all kinds of stuff. But, you know, share that with safe people um, so that they can walk with you and help you, you know, healthy people. So Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
the the Bible says this in First Peter chapter five verse seven. It says, "Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you." And I think that's important for us to understand. Yeah. It's 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 one thing to be just you know letting it all out and just venting and and we, we're good at that, but you have to understand like He does care for you. Mm-hmm. When God is listening, He's listening. You know, when you're talking to somebody and, you know, you're just like venting your problems and you're like, I'm going through this and I'm going through that. And it's like, if you ask them, did you hear what I just said? They'll be like, no, I can't repeat anything you just said. Because some people just, they just don't listen, you know, but that's not how God is. And that's not who God is. He is absolutely invested in your entire life. He knows exactly everything that's going on, but he cares for you. God is concerned with what's going on in your life. The cares that we have, if you read this verse, and it's Greek, the word care actually means uh, like the, the, the cares of this life, mm-hmm. the, the things that are flooding your mind, the things that are detaching you and taking your focus off God. But the word care in light of God caring for you is his concern, yeah. his divine protection over you, that God is, actually cares and he's thinking about you. Yeah. It's not that God's worried or he's tripping out with like an anxiety attack in heaven. He literally is invested into you. Yeah. And he is absolutely caring about everything that's going on inside of your life. Yeah. You have to understand that. Like you have to understand that God isn't just a being in heaven that, you know, will, you know, take your, you know, take your voicemail when he can. He listens. Yeah. I don't know how he does it. Mm-hmm. But he's God and he literally hears everything that's going on with me and yeah. inside of my heart and in, in my mind and in my life. And that's like beyond therapeutic because I know yeah. someone that actually cares is is listening to yeah. everything that's going on inside of me. And so in light of that, you guys, I wanted to get into our topics now. And so we're going to get in first we're going to hit um, singleness and then we will get into the topic of. Uh, relationships and dating in light of the Bible. And so when it comes to singleness, this is this is huge, okay? Um, the Bible does address it, um, but in our culture, we live in 2018, and the definition of singleness can literally mean anything. And yeah. You know, and yeah. so when we talk about this, we want to talk about it in the context of a biological male, biological female, deciding to be in a relationship that goes into the future someday. Mm -hmm. And so this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. And so first off, let's hit the topic of singleness. I know this is something that you're passionate about because when I read your stuff, I've I've read stuff, I've bought some of the girls in my youth group, your books, Mm -hmm. dude. And I know that this is something that you're absolutely passionate about. So what is your first initial thought when it comes to being single as a young woman? Yeah. So you might be thinking like, you know, what, (laughs) what gives homegirl the like license to talk about singleness? Um, Real quick backstory, you know, when I, when I gave my heart to the Lord when I was six years old, um, I remember seeing, you know, amazing relationships at church that just exemplified the gospel, you know, girls would see fairy tales and I would see like my youth leaders, Mm -hmm. kids ministry leaders, whatever. And I remember saying like, God, I want to go on my first date with my husband. Yeah. Uh, so I'm 28 years old. I will be 29 this year. I have yet to go on my first date. So I've had uh, 28 full years of singleness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think the biggest thing for me, you know, when I think of singleness is, um, you know, I spent a lot of years in my singleness, Andrew, just really focused on the wrong things, you know, that I made the focus of my singleness is God, where's the one, mm. you know, where is this person you have for me? Yeah. And just allowing that to occupy my conversation, my thoughts, my emotions and other things. But one of the things that God showed me that I uh, want to turn to is in, uh, you know, first Corinthians seven. And this is what God says, you know, to young men um, and young men and women who are single, you know, it says in verse 32, Um, You know, this is Paul talking to uh, the believers in Corinth. He says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly, worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman 
is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint on you, but to promote good order and secure you undivided devotion, undivided devotion to the Lord. Yep. And real quick, you know, I want to to hone in on that undivided devotion because I, you know, even within the church, right? That, um, a lot of singles, they're really in a place where if you're single, it's like looked down upon, yeah. you know, where people are almost like, girl, your man's coming. And we're just like, I was actually good until you said that just now. <laughs> or they try to set you up with people that are like this tall, you know, I'm like, Aww. not five ten. Can't be dating no Petrie. You know what I'm saying? Petrie is, is the dinosaur from Lynn before time. <laughs> so, And, you know, and I, and I felt like, you know, for a long time, you know, that it was almost like that a lot of singles view themselves and the singles in the church are viewed as, you know, you have some type of cancer if you're single, that it's not championed, it's not celebrated, it's not something that's encouraged. And I remember honestly, at the end of last year and coming into this year that I was like, God, if I could have another year of singleness these are the things I would want to do for Mm -hmm. you. And I was literally like, I want to go back to the human trafficking recovery home in Nevada. Did that. You know, I want to go to India with my friend Rondi and I'm going with her this summer. You know, I was like, God, I want to go uh, back to the Philippines with my church. I'm going back to the Philippines. And there's all these things that I wanted to do for God. And my focus, you know, that undivided devotion is that I was like, God, I want to literally be so sold out for you that I'm not focused on where is he, who is he or whatever. Like, I just want to chase after you as hard as I can Mm -hmm. and just do what you've put in my heart. And I'm at a place, even in my singleness, to those of you who are single in church, I don't care if you're 18, 20, 21, junior high or high school, we waste so much time trying to please some guy or girl, trying to get them to see us as godly, trying to, to make them see that we're the one, whatever it is. And I've just realized that the undivided devotion that Paul talked about that when you're single that your focus should be pleasing the Lord and yep. serving him and so I remember there was this couple in 2016 I was really struggling with my singleness I was seeing so many of my friends I go to church my church campus is based at the bridal college in Marietta mm-hmm. <laughs> it's actually the Bible college and it was like every weekend I was going to a wedding every weekend I was yep. going to a baby shower bridal shower and I grew so frustrated with God I was like where are you (laughs) and where Where is is he, he? (laughs) you know? And I was like, do you hear me? And I remember this couple at my church, uh, her name's Crystal Hughes, her and her husband moved up to pastor church out of state. Uh And they just came up to me one day and they were like, Christina, like you are a gift to the body of Christ. And I was like, that's not really what I want to hear right now. But I remember crying and just the Lord was like, Christina, hear what they're saying. And I just was like, God, like, that's why you have me single right now. And at the time I was, you know, 26 uh, and I and I had to recognize and even now I'll be almost 30 this year, you know, and I'll be 29 this year. Like, God, it's my job in this time to love you and to love the body of Christ. Because one day when I'm married, you know, like my first ministry is serving, you know, first, you know, loving the Lord first mm-hmm. and then serving my husband and, you know, taking care of my kids. And so my friends who are single, You have such a freedom to go, you know, missions, trips, learn about your identity in Christ, because the main purpose of our singleness is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Like it says in Deuteronomy, it, you know, it learn your identity in the Lord, Mm -hmm. um, have a deep intimacy with Christ and just understand what your purpose is. And honestly, you guys, if I'm single for five, 10, 15 years, I'm like, Dude, life with Jesus is amazing. And if a husband decides to come in my life, you know, yeah. um, that's cool too. But I'm not waiting on my spouse to like be happy or feel complete because I'm I've learned to be complete in Christ. Yeah. And I think uh I, I'm glad that you approached it that way because when you look at our culture and you look at the way the youth is coming up and even when I was in high school and even to where things are right now, is there is and we have to explain this well and right, is there's nothing wrong with being married and there's yeah. nothing wrong with being single. Yeah. But what mankind is infamous for is taking what God has ordained and given to us and distorted and perverted it. Yeah. 
Yes. And so obviously that that can we can take that in all kind of directions, but in the in the arena or the lane of singleness, I think singleness has become idolatry in a lot of young people's lives. And it can stem from anything. Like I, I, oh, I'm so thirsty. Like I just, and, and you know, a girl would never admit that. Even some guys, even some guys yeah. would never admit that. Mm-hmm. That I just need to be with somebody, and my life is gonna change once yeah. that happens. They are gonna fulfill me. They are going mm-hmm. to take care of all of my problems. And and if we make a bunch of money as well, if I'm just not single, I need that person. Yeah. And what people fail to recognize is that. Before you find the one that God has for you, you have to understand that he is the one first. Yes. And when you come to that realization that you're not out here like trying to, you know, you're on like Christian mingle doing crazy stuff, like trying to, you know, you're like DMing people on the side, like trying to act like you're not like ratchet, but you are if you're doing that, you know, but, and I'm sorry if I say that, but this is the culture that we're in. You have to understand that the one is Jesus. He is the maker. He is the husband of the bride of Christ. And he is the ultimate single. Yeah, You understand that, right? Mm-hmm. Like Jesus, there's no indication that he was ever married. There's no indication that he was ever in a relationship. Um, he had a family, had a mom, had a dad, had some bros, had some cousins, but the Bible does not record in any section of the scripture that Jesus in human form, as God walked in human flesh in his ministry, he never married. And so you have to think about that. Like if there's anyone that can relate to being single, it's the son of God. Yeah. Okay. You have to understand that in light of his humanity. Okay. God was, Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. Mm -hmm. And so even in singleness, I'm sure there are things that Jesus absolutely can relate to you in of being alone, of wanting a companion or desiring something like that. I I can't make a scripture or or take a scriptural reference to that, but I, I wouldn't doubt that there are things that Jesus can relate to us being single because he was single his whole life. Yeah. And so when you understand that, you have to understand that the ultimate relationship is with Christ. He fulfills you. He loves you. He's with you every single day. He never takes his eyes off of you. He's absolutely obsessed with you in a righteous and healthy way, not a ratchet and weird way. Um, he, he, he is all about you. And so when you come to that realization, because when I discovered that God loved me, like I like when I understood that God loved me, when like when I act, like because people could say like God loves you all day long, like God loves you, like yeah, so does my mom, you know. Mm-hmm. But when you understand who God is, and what that means, and it's for you, it changes everything. Yeah. And when it comes to being single, it's hard. There's so many different issues, there's trials, there's temptations, but I wanted to hit on that single idolatry because I think a lot of kids are just, um, they have the right mentality. You have this desire. It's okay to want to be married. It's okay to want to be in a relationship, but if it gets sinful and you start becoming idolatrous, you're taking what God has given us and you're worshiping it. You're not taking what God has given us and worshiping him with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think when it comes to singleness and relationships, a lot of people are thinking that hey, that could even come with, you know, man's perspective on you. Because like when you say that it's like a crime to be single or mm-hmm. you're looked down upon because you're single, like, no, you're not. Like yeah. God, God doesn't look down on someone because they're not married yet. Mm-hmm. And God is maybe maturing that person or he's preparing them for ministry. But it's crazy that you brought up that verse because that was the verse (laughs) you just took it out of my mouth. But I love that verse because it makes a distinction that for a single person, just fulfill everything in who Jesus is. Give your all to him. If you're at school, if you're in ministry, if you're at church, whatever you are doing, just get so obsessed with him. Mm -hmm. You want to know why? Not just so you can find someone, 
But so when you do find someone, you know exactly how to take care of them and love them as God loves them because that marriage will not survive if you haven't come to that maturity yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And even like speaking into that, Andrew, because I I know that so many of us, you know, like we have – built with inside of us this strong desire for love you know and we hold out our hearts like it's this this cup or whatever and it's like we're we're sometimes as girls you know we go from guy to guy to guy thinking can you fill my heart with the love it desires can you fill my heart with the love it desires um or guys you know with girls like can you fill it can you fill it yeah. but really god looks at us and he's like i'm the only one that can fill that and someone else's love like God's love is the source to our fulfillment and satisfaction and completion, you know, Mm -hmm. and even what you're talking about it becoming like idolatry. Like what I've realized is that God, like I had so for so much of my single life, um, put marriage on a pedestal. And I remember one day my friend spoke to me and she said, Christina, if you can't be okay without it, you're not going to be okay with it. Yeah. Because what if God does give you that, that relationship or marriage? And it doesn't fill that void inside of you. You're going to grow bitter with that gift. Yeah. And so I've realized that I have to seek the one whose name means love. Mm. That God's name is agape. And everyone, re- we, there's so many songs written about love. Yeah. There's so many movies about love. But the love we were always looking for was Jesus. And me and my friend, you know, we always text each other and we're like, dude, he was always the one, you know? And like, just realizing that every time we go off astray or think that some guy would be the source to that, or we, we, we might be interested in someone. Mm -hmm. She's always like, remember the Lord was always the one, you know? So that even if people disappoint that God's love is always there and which is why it's so important, even in your singleness, my friends, to have an effective devotional life to sit at the feet of Jesus the way Mary did in the book of Luke and to allow him, you know, through a time of worship and reading of the word, you know, and even through discipleship and getting involved in church in a youth group to fill your heart with his love, because it's almost like if you try to fill your heart with the love the world has to offer you or with a guy or girl, that love is going to make your heart more empty than before. And when we allow God's love to be poured into us, like it will leave our heart overflowing Absolutely. And as a single person, like I'm not searching, like I look forward to the day that God brings my spouse and, you know, orchestrates whatever he's going to do, but I'm not looking forward to that in this time of my life in order to complete or satisfy me because I have found that love, but it takes a daily refilling. Yeah. You know, so there, you know, what's interesting is, are, are you a Disney kid? Um, I go to Disneyland like sometimes, but yeah. I'm not like obsessed with Disney. No. Okay. Well, I grew up a Disney kid. And okay, I was obsessed with yeah. Disney kid. But uh, like, if, if you think about like Disney, right? And you think about, it's always the same story. It's always the happily ever after story that the girl finds the man of her dreams. Yeah. And I think that's like integrated in every little girl's mind, you know? Mm-hmm. And, but I think it's so hard for young girls to come to terms with that Jesus is the ultimate superhero, the ultimate um, husband. He's the ultimate happily ever after. He's the ultimate, he, he's the prince of peace. He's beyond yeah. Prince Charming, okay? Yeah. And I think it's because you can't physically see him. I think this is what a lot of young people struggle with because I get questions like this all the time, like how do I love someone and I can't even see them? And that's a valid question. Like, I understand that. There's a verse here in Peter that I love. It's in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. It says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Life is hard. It's a season. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. These are huge Mm -hmm. statements. Listen, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, that's depending upon, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. 
when he's writing that, he's writing that to Christians in Rome that are suffering persecution beyond our imagine. And he's telling them, you guys love him. Mm-hmm. Even though, you know, your Christian husbands are being behead in front of their families. Even though in Rome, they're burning down Christians' houses. And it's, it's, it was insane. And he writes that. And he's letting them know, you guys haven't even seen his face. You love him. Yeah. Yet believing depending upon you that's hope that's faith that's taking your mind outside of this physical universe that we live in and understanding that god is beyond that he is at the right hand of the father interceding on our behalf so how do you do that you can't identify your relationship with god in physical images because the Bible doesn't even indicate what Jesus looked like. If anything, Isaiah 53 says his physical appearance was something that we didn't, wouldn't be attracted to. Mm-hmm. But other than that, loving Jesus, even though we don't even see him, how do you have that relationship? How do you have a day-by-day relationship with someone that you've never even seen before? Mm-hmm. And that's why I think it's, it's important. It's, it's imperative and essential that you're born again. Mm-hmm. You're spending time with God. You're reading the Bible. You're not reading it just religiously. You're reading it because you, there, there's, there's a relationship yeah. going on. Mm-hmm. And there's a difference there. I think when a lot of young people understand that what the scripture has revealed about God's ultimate love towards mankind and you accept that without even having to see what he looks like blows your mind. Yeah. It captivates your heart. And everything begins to make sense. Mm -hmm. I think that's why Jesus said, abide in my love. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, let's continue. Um, Let's transition from singleness to dating and relationships. So we'll kind of, we'll kind of couple these things two together. Yeah. um, Because, I mean, your definition of dating could be anything. Um, If you're in Christian circles, it would be considered courting, I guess you could say. Um, But relationships in light of the Bible. And I wanted to address this in a way where it's made clear, okay? God is not against relationships. God is not Mm anti-marriage between a biological male and a biological female. Um, God is for relationships. But I think what a lot, and I'm just going to be bold and say this, I think what a lot of pastors, a lot of teachers of influence um, make it kind of uncomfortable to the sense where you you kind of paint this picture where like God God doesn't want you in a relationship, Mm -hmm. but he does. It's just you have to do it God's way. You have to do it the right way. And that's kind of what I, that's what I want to make clear here today Mm -hmm. is in light of a relationship, okay, where do we go from there? Like, let's say you got like a 13-year-old and a 14-year-old wanting to be together. Is that wrong? Is that bad? Mm-hmm. And I know that's like a black and white statement. There's so many things you could say in there, but what would you encourage? Yeah. So, you know, if you're, you know, 13, 14, you know, junior high, whatever, um, just know that God, like, it's not bad to be attracted to somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like God gave us desires to be in relationship. Mm-hmm. But biblically, um, relationship is for the purpose of marriage. You know, it is the step before marriage. And if you're 13 and 14 years old, years out from marriage, why put yourself into something that, um, that you are years away from? Because a relationship where you are official and, you know, physically boundaries could get crossed, it puts you in a line of temptation, right? Where you, um, I've had many, you know, junior hires and high schoolers like come to me crying and they're saying, Christina, we cross boundaries physically in our relationship, you know, and because of that, you know, you know, we are now full of shame and mm-hmm. they love the Lord, but now it's, it's ended. But even, you know, if we were talking more on the, on the, in the area of, you know, say high school, right. Yeah. I had yep. 
a couple of my uh, students in my youth group, you know, I love you guys, uh, Noah and Riley. They are, um, you know, 16 and 17 years old, you know, they're both seniors in high school now. I think they're both 17 now, yeah. uh, seniors in high school. And they, you know, I think they liked each other for a couple years, you know, yeah. and they went to, um, they went and sought wisdom, you know, from an older godly couple, you know, who gave them wisdom. They asked their parents permission, you know, to start dating. And they um, set clear accountability, clear guidelines, because, like, I, I know that it's nothing to do with, like, age, you know, mm-hmm. but they're, like, it's not like an age thing, but it's a maturity thing. Yep. And so for them, like, even for me, I remember coming back, like, Riley's one of my youth girls, and I know she wouldn't mind me sharing this. When I got back from the Philippines last year, she would never talk to me about boys. Mm. Come back from the Philippines, she's like, guess what? And I was like, what? She's like... I'm dating. And I was like, who? <laughs> She's like, Noah. And I was like, yeah, dude, Noah's fine. And they're two of the most solid, godly people. They serve in our church. They serve in our youth group. And they are like so mature, like spiritually, emotionally to be able to handle that. And, you know, even Mary, you know, Mary was 14. You know, they said like, you know, she was mm-hmm. 14 when, you know, she, you know, was betrothed to Joseph. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in that time, that was appropriate, you know, for relationship or marriage or whatever. But if you are not spiritually mature, and I think it is a case by case basis, you know, to be in a relationship, like why put yourself in the midst of something to where like, you know, it's not going to go anywhere Yeah. or like you put yourself in the line of fire for temptation. I'll put it in this perspective. Um, this is what I always counsel people. Um, I take them straight to God's ordination of marriage. Yeah. And it's in Genesis chapter 3 where God literally, he's created Adam. He gives him his wife Eve. And God comes out and he says this, Therefore a man shall leave his father okay, and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's, that's the spiritual unity yeah. that God identifies. That's marriage. That's what God has ordained. Now, in light of a relationship, if an individual, the goal is always marriage. Yeah. Okay. When it comes to dating and when it comes to courtship or whatever you want to call it, it's not like 31 flavors. Um, no recreational dating. You know, no, it's like, let it's, me just, it's, <laughs> let me, let me try this on and put it back on the rack. It doesn't work that way. That's not God's um, mind. Mm-hmm. God, God's mind is for his idea for marriage is singular in the sense where one partner is singularly looking at that partner and yeah. vice versa. So the reason why I say that is if you're in a relationship and you have no intentions of getting married, like why date? Then why date? You're not, you are not walking according to God's design because God's design God is pro um, biological female and ma- uh, male marriage. Mm-hmm. God is okay with that. God has ordained that. But if you are just, you know, trying, and I'll speak for the guys, if, if you're just, you know, trying girls on for size, if, if you're just trying different, you know, ethnicities, or mm-hmm. you just kind of want to see what works or what doesn't work, like you are not walking according to God's design. Mm-hmm. God's design is that a man shall leave his father and his mother and be yeah. joined to his wife. So yeah. when you think about that, you have to understand there's there's so many things that you have to consider in that. If you're a young man and you want to get into a relationship, you have to ask yourself this question. Am I am I looking into this because I want to marry this woman? Yeah. If the answer is no, then you need to walk away from that relationship. Mm-hmm. Because God, he himself is he's about marriage. He, 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 he wants to see marriages flourish. It's, it's yeah. God's heart. He gave that to, to mankind. And so for a young guy or, or even a young girl out there, and, and if, if, if a guy is not just financially not all there, but like spiritually not all there, if, if he doesn't have his stuff together, how is he supposed to lead you? And in context of the Bible and a marriage, mm-hmm. the husband is the spiritual leader yes. within the home. It doesn't mean the woman is more inferior. It just means that God has ordained that Mm -hmm. ministry for him. Yeah. So, you know, girl, 
like take a look at your man, okay? Yeah, girl, take a look, girl. Take take a look at your man, and if if he he, he he's not gonna be Jesus, okay? But if he is immature in you know financially, if he's just not working out, or he he doesn't even want to work, okay? He he's not gonna provide for you. Uh, or even spiritually, if he struggles like going to church, if he can barely even read the Bible for himself, if uh, if if he says that his favorite book of the Bible is Jesus, like, dude, you know, okay, because some people say some. <laughs> girl, you need to drop him like an overdue yeah. library book, or I'll drop him like an overdue library book. Because, you know, anytime, the longer you wait to drop off an overdue library book, the higher your bill is right. Yep. Like you need to the fine is greater. Yep. Yeah. And even, um, like Absolutely. speaking into that, you guys in Ephesians five, verse 25 to all the girls out there, exactly what Andrew said that the template for like, it's, it's almost like, you know, it's almost like, like sometimes like when you run a race, you know, like before you actually step on the field to run, like, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, our Christian walk is like a race. Like your relationship is like a warm up for the race of marriage yeah. and don't step on the field to warm up if y'all aren't ready for the race. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And the purpose of every relationship and the goal of every relationship should be marriage. Yep. It shouldn't be like, Oh, I'm going to test drive this. Like, and some of you might be in a place where you're like, well, I don't know if maybe the, who God has for me. So before you say anything to the other person, you need to sit your booty down <laughs> and you need to ask the Lord and spend more time in prayer Talk to a leader at church and get wisdom and find out who it is that you're trying to pursue. <laughs> Don't just go and try to feel it out. Yep. Anyway, so in Ephesians 5, verse 25, this is God's design for marriage. It says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or blemish or any such thing that she might be holy and without mm. blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are all members of the body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the church shall become one flesh. Yeah. And what I love about that, you guys, is that, you know, even I remember being, you know, in my younger 20s, you know, being interested in what I thought were like these amazing godly men, right? And I remember I was like, they had the whole package of what I thought, you know, was what God had. And I remember in my life, these young men would put feelers out there. Mm. They would play games with me. They would like dance around. And I remember I would, I would be like, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm in my 20s. Like, are we in junior high? Like, are we in kindergarten? Like, why are we playing games? Yeah. And I remember I had, you know, people, you know, that were discipling me that sat me down and was like, Christina, like, you are not someone's plan B. Yep. You are not someone's backup plan. If a man, no matter how amazing or godly he, he, he may appear to be, can't sit you down and declare his intentions, you need to put him back on the shelf like an overdue library book type of thing. And it was in that season of my life that God really... Um, but honestly, like, you know, girls and guys, like I stayed in that place where I allowed, you know, a couple different, one of them was like, you know, a couple different guys in different seasons to play those games with me mm. because I believe that that was all that I was worth. But when God finally showed me like Christina, you know, Ephesians five, your husband is going to have a sacrificial love for you. He's going to pursue you as, and like, it was almost like the gospel was like God saying like, this is what it's supposed to look like. Yeah. That is Christ pursued the church that a man is supposed to pursue a woman, but only when God, when that young man has heard from the Lord, if a young man is putting out fillers there, trying to fill it out, yep. he hasn't heard from the Lord. Yep. That's all in his flesh. And if a guy's doing that to you, girl, you need to cut that and put on the shelf, girl. Here's, yeah. what, here's what I want to point out for you, yeah. for you guys and yeah. for you young ladies out there. Yeah. Listen to this again. This is keeps coming up. Therefore a man. Okay shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Yeah. That's literally speaking of a transition of lifestyles and yes. maturity. When, like Paul said, when I became a man, you know, when mm -hmm. I was a child, I thought like a child. When I became a man, I put mm -hmm. childish things away. Yeah. You have to understand that marriage 
is according to the Bible, I can speak on this according to what the Bible has to say, there has to be a departure Mm -hmm. of childish immaturity and and boyishness. There has to be a departure from that. That goes Mm -hmm. financially, that goes spiritually, that goes mentally, you know, socially as well. Emotionally. Emotionally. You have to ask yourself this question. is, Is this guy, is he maturing is he mature? Is he ready to yeah. take care of me? Yeah. In these ways, and I'm I'm talking to you, ladies, right now. It, ask yourself these questions: Is this man? Is he ready to be a man? He doesn't. Is okay. You may not like this, okay? And I know a lot of people are struggling with this, and there's different situations. But the Bible is very clear: You have to leave your father and your mother. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean you forsake your relationship with them. That's a transition of lifestyles. If your idea, if your plan. Your 10-year or 15-year plan is to marry this girl and live in her parents' house. I would really doubt if you're hearing from God because I, the scripture is very clear. Mm-hmm. There has to be a transition of you becoming a man. Yeah. But th- you don't do that by yourself. Yeah. If God is really in this relationship, why won't God provide for you to take care of his daughter? Mm-hmm. There must be something else going on. Yeah. And so you have to ask yourself these questions, especially as a young woman. Is this guy mature? Is he ready to be a man and take care of me, provide for me? Is he ready to be my spiritual guide? Mm-hmm. Is, is he ready to step up to the plate in this way? And if the answer is no, please, please just reconsider. Yeah. Do not go any further until this guy decides to step up to the plate and grow up. Yeah. And girls, I know that so I've talked to so many young women and I found my and myself in that place, you know, my younger 20s, like I said, where you might look at a guy and you might be like, girl, he has potential. Girl, I remember waiting around for people for sometimes two, three, up to four years to grow in their relationship with God to know their identity in God, to have a solid intimacy with the Lord, to finally come to a place where they were willing to be a man and step up to the plate to pursue me. And I wasted sometimes up to four years on those things. And do you know where that took me? It took my eyes off of the Lord and onto that person waiting for them to catch up. And it slowed me down in my relationship with God. And I remember coming to a place, you know, a few years ago where I was like, Lord, I'm done waiting for these boys. I'm ready to buckle down and put on my spiritual running shoes and chase after you as hard as my can, can, knowing that one day my husband is going to be a man of your word. He's going to be a man like King David. And, you know, I want to highlight King David. King David is an amazing man to study in the Bible. Dude, King David was a man of worship. When he was in the backside of the desert, he wasn't a young man being like, oh, girl, look at me. Like, I'm a man of the word, like doing it all out in the the light. He was a man who sought the Lord when no one else was watching. Mm -hmm. A lot of the Psalms was written when he was just worshiping the Lord. He wasn't wearing a crown. He wasn't a warrior for Israel. It was just him and the Lord. He was a man of worship. He was a lover of Jesus. And he was a man of war. And that is the kind of man that you want. And that was something that God has showed me. Christina, your husband will know how to pursue your heart because he's been pursuing me his his whole life, yeah. you know, your, that your husband will know how to love you because he's first learned how to love me. Your husband will know how to lead you in the word because he's become a man of the word. Yep. And so I've given up trying to, to wait for people, you know, yep. and we're all a work in progress. And I'm not saying that you need, you need to have healthy expectations, but I'm saying that, you know, the Bible talks about Andrew being unequally yoked, yep. you know, and I remember waiting for these guys that I was unequally yoked with that I was more mature in my walk with them because they weren't seeking God. And the Lord was like, girl, you just got to keep going. And I was like, for sure, adios. Yeah. And I look back now and I'm like, homeboys are like five, 10 miles still behind me, you know? Yeah. And you want someone, it's like girls especially, where you want a man who's mature, who can lead you in your walk with Christ. Because according to Ephesians 5, that's his job is to wash you in the word. Mm -hmm. And if you're leading him spiritually, He's going to pull you down more than you try to lead him. So I'm just going to put a period there because, you know. <laughs> I uh, The Bible, I wanted to address that where yeah. the Bible makes it very clear um, that we ourselves are to not be unequally yoked 
with unbelievers. And so that's a that's let let's hit on that real quick. Because there are a lot of kids, there's a lot of young people, even adults. Um, you know, maybe he'll come to Christ because of me. Yeah. <laughs> like I haven't heard that like a million times or yeah. or you know, I want I want to reach him or I want to reach her like she's so beautiful. You have no idea. Like if she just became a Christian, if yeah. I just wait this out, like you have no idea. It's like you got to think about what the Bible says. Yeah. And the Bible is very clear. Do not be unequally yoked specifically mm-hmm. with unbelievers. And he yeah. even goes on to say, like, what, is an, what, a, what does a darkness have with light? Mm-hmm. What does Jesus have to do with, he makes a reference to, to Satan as well in, in, his, in his different name. I have to pull up the scripture right now. But the, the point that Paul was making, he says, what, wh- wh- how do they coexist? It's a spiritual, it's an issue of fellowship. Yeah. It's also an issue of maturity. But if you're an individual that's trying to make a relationship work and you're, you're, you're a Christian, you're a born again Christian, and you are just trying to convince yourself that you should stay with this person because, you know, you don't want to be alone or you don't, you know, want something to happen or you're scared. God is going to bless that. Mm-hmm. Because this person will just poison you, like you yeah. said. It's um, the what comes to mind is Solomon. Yeah. Solomon was amazing. He was walking with God. God had ordained him. God had absolutely used him in mighty ways to rebuild the temple. He was walking with God, but his downfall was ultimately foreign women. He was unequally yoked, not with just one. The Bible is like hundreds of concubines and yeah. different foreign women. And the Bible is very specific that those women, they caused his heart to depart from the living God. Yeah, It's an issue of fellowship. Not only did he walk away from God, Christina, he started worshiping their gods. Yeah. Like, yeah. think about that. Okay, yeah. so it, you ha- it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that has to do with fellowship. If you're asking this question, if you're wondering why, why can't I be with someone that's an unbeliever, you, you have to understand that person doesn't have the same um, heart as you. Mm-hmm. They don't have the same spirit as you. Yeah. They don't have the same mentality. They don't have the mind of Christ. They have nothing within themselves to pursue mm-hmm. and live the righteous life that you desire to live. And you'll be going in two opposite directions yeah. and it'll only end in destruction. Yeah. And um, I, I can't find the verse initially, but in, you know, in Revelation, it talks about how, you know, um, one, like where God speaks to one of the churches, you know, that mm-hmm. would be like almost like God speaking to us. This one thing I have towards you mm-hmm. is that you have left your first love. Yeah. And you guys, when you become a lover of Jesus, anything that will compromise that relationship with him, lead you away from that relationship. It's like you're not willing to even entertain in your life. And I've had yeah. so many friends of all ages throughout my entire walk with God that have that have gotten into relationships with people, you know, that are non-believers. And they will tell me, Christina, we know this is wrong, but, you know, he came to church last week or, you know, or I can lead him to the Lord or yeah. I can lead her to the Lord. And that relationship always ended in them having sex outside of marriage. Yep. It always ended in heartbreak. And they would always come to me heartbroken and I wouldn't throw it in their face, you know, and say, you know, like I told you so, but I would say, okay, what do you feel like God's showing you through this? And so some of you are like, well, you know, they believe that there's a God, but there's a difference between believing in God and, and walking with God, you know, like, does that person know God the way you, that you know God and some people, um, and I feel like this is maybe for some of you out there. There's someone that might just be seeking God with you because they want to be with you. But what's their intention? Yeah. Is it because they really want to love God or is it because they want to be in a relationship with you? There's an artery uh, hidden motive. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you are in that situation, time is going to tell, you know, like that this person's not for real. And I want to encourage you, cut it off before those their roots become, you know, deep in yours. And then it's hard to detach emotionally, yeah. you know? Yeah. Here's the reference. It's in second Corinthians. If you're wondering second Corinthians six, verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers yeah. for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness. Wow. And what communion, see, these are fellowship words. What communion has light with darkness and what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Yeah. 
And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. It's an issue of fellowship. It's even an issue of worship. Yes. If you don't worship the same God, you should not be with that person. Yes. End of story. And you might ask why. Because you don't have the same mind. You don't have the Mm -hmm. same spirit. Uh, God is not in that person. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing literally within them to hold them back from doing horrendous and crazy adulterous things to you. Um, and you'll be sitting in your room wondering if th- this person is cheating on you because they don't have the mind of Christ. There's nothing holding them back. Yeah. Not to say that Christian relationships can't get into that, mm-hmm. but you're even pushing your luck even further if yeah. you want to get into a relationship that's unequally yoked. Yeah. I mean, you have to think about it this way. Why would you want to be with someone that does not have any interest in the God that you love more than yeah. them? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And even Andrew, like I've met people, you know, even guys that are, you know, quote unquote godly who love ministry more than Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I've had people that have been like, Christina, what about this guy? And there's been several times over the last few years where I've, I've looked at these young men and I'm like, you know what? Their ministry has become their God. Mm. Their, what they do for God has become their God. And they might love Jesus, but they don't love Jesus, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember just um, coming to that point, even really within the last few years where I was, where I said, God, I believe that, that you have a man for me, like King David, who, um, who I can honestly say that, you know, no matter what King David did, whether he was like, you know, a warrior, you know, a worshiper, um, whether he was a king, you know, no matter what he did, he was first a lover of Jesus and um, a man after God's own heart yeah a man after God's own heart and that's what I want to encourage you guys with that sometimes people you know kind of the Bible talks about you know they have the appearance of godliness but their hearts are far from the Lord and you can recognize someone's life that they have a true love for Jesus not because of what they do for God but because you can see that wholehearted love and devotion and passion for Jesus, like day in and day out, like they wake up, you know, everyone has their own Devo time, but they carve out time Mm -hmm. to seek the Lord. And there's a pastor in my life that I grew up going, you know, he would like go, he would come to all my youth camps at harvest, you know, and his name is John Corson. And my family used to go to his Tuesday night study at Calvary Costa Mesa, you know, when I was in eighth Mm -hmm. grade. And, I remember seeing Pastor John's life and saying, Lord, this man loves you. Yeah. You know, he's sold out for you. Like he has a heart that is like, he has just like a simple love and devotion to you. And I remember as a little girl looking at Pastor John and saying, Lord, I'm going to marry a man like that one Mm. day who, you know, like he teaches a word, whatever, but he just loves you. And no matter what life brings his way, he is so faithful to seeking you. And you guys, I want to encourage you that don't allow the facade of what people put up to fool you. Anyone can can talk the talk, but it really is like who is walking the walk, you know, like who's for real. And so, yeah. Let's uh, let's end on this note. Yeah. Um, what can confuse you is your definition of love. Yeah. And love is not um, sinful sexual pleasure. Um, love is not, um, sex outside of God's marriage ordination. Um, love is not, um, fornication. It's not, um, having, you know, obsessions with people. Um, this is what the Bible says about love in first Corinthians chapter 13. It says, love suffers long and is kind Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. If a guy is just seeking lust, if he just wants to please himself off of you, I I really really question if he loves you. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It has no evil intentions. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. 
and it doesn't seek its own. Yeah. That, that's kind of what I wanted to hit on right now because I think a lot of girls think that because a guy is sexually attracted to me and he wants me, and I'm going to say this stuff because it, it, this is what we're dealing with in this generation. When you have a 13-year-old girl that's not getting any attention from her father and then you got some 17-year-old kid that all of a sudden is like sexually obsessed with her, mm-hmm. she throws herself at him. Yeah. And she thinks it's love, but it's not. It's just another kid lusting after you because you're vulnerable and he sees that he can get to you because you're dying for attention and you're dying for acceptance. You always have to ask yourself this question, would Jesus do this to me? Yes. In light of the Bible. If this individual is acting this way and Jesus wouldn't in light of the Bible, you have to really question if this man or this girl loves me because Jesus is never going to lead you down a path of sin. Ever. Yes. Ever. And so th- we could say so much more yeah. about now? relationships, but there are yeah. a few questions. I was just letting them brew. Yeah. Um, the first one we have here, I'm going to try and paraphrase these. Um, somebody is asking, I brought my boyfriend to the Lord, and I know in the Bible it takes a godly man to lead me in my walk. But I feel I'm leading him. I pray for him to become as strong as, strong as I am if we marry, even marry. Yeah. But my mom tells me I need a man with greater faith than me. I would listen to your mom. And it discourages me. I am happy where I am and we go to church. I made, it made me wonder if this is who I'm supposed to be with or not God's plan. I want to be with him, but also... I yearn for God's plan for my life. Yeah. Take it away, bro. Wow. Okay. First, what I said, um, this is a very sensitive question because this is your life. Yeah. And the first thing I'll say, always listen to your mom when it comes to relationships. If your mom is a Christian, your mom, God uses your parents. And if God is using your mom to identify something wrong with this boy, because she's made it clear they're both Christians, they all go to church. If God has identified something and you're, is using your mom to speak with you, don't, don't ignore that. If she has valid reasons, which it seems like she does, if, if she's already identifying that he, you're leading him and it's vice versa, that, that's unbiblical. That's the reverse design of a marriage. And so to answer your question, the same thing I said earlier, the Bible is very clear that marriage is the goal. Yes. And when a man takes a man, not a boy, not a little boy, not a teenager that doesn't know what he wants, a man of God, when a man decides that he is going to take on a wife, he leaves his mother and his father, there's a sense of maturity that takes place spiritually, physically, mentally in his entire life. He's ready for that role because he's going to lead you. He's going to take care of you. God is going to use him and utilize him to love you, to take care of your needs, to physically take care of you, to financially take care of you. And if this guy that's in your life, if you don't see that in him, then I would tell him, you need to step it up or this isn't going to work. Yes. Because God's plan is marriage. Yes. And there's responsibility when it comes to the man. When it comes to the man, there's a responsibility. What would you say? Yeah, and to, you know, the girl who posted this, like, I would say, you know, sweetheart, like, if you are having these questions, you know, um, if you are even second-guessing, you know, this relationship, you know, if your mom has had to really step in, like, your mom probably sees your relationship, right, day in and day out. She probably sees you, you know, you know, as she, as you guys probably hang out at the house, you know, and at church and whatever. There's probably a check in your mom's spirit, like, I don't believe this is God's best for my baby girl. Mm. And so I would, I would first encourage you, you know, to to ask the Lord, um, to go talk to, you know, uh, maybe a pastor at your church, you know, like maybe an older woman at church, and and get counsel, um, because if this is not God's best for your life. 
And if this man is not making those efforts, you know, to really lead you spiritually, it means that you're are running ahead of him and you're just waiting for him to catch up. But I don't know about you, but I have friends that sometimes are like, Christina, do you want to go jogging with me? And they are runners and I slow them down because I'm not a jogger, (laughs) you Mm. know? And so it makes them slower in the end. And if this man, if our goal in life is to run towards Christ, and if this young man is slowing you down in your pursuit of Christ, he's probably not the right one for you. I'd agree. Yeah. Here's the second one. Um, and we'll, 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 we'll go back to, cause she asked two questions, but I'm going to yeah. do them in order. Um, the second one is how can someone be in a relationship with God when knowing what comes with a relationship is love, but also trust and have faith but that person has difficulty understanding what love really is, how to trust even when their trust was broken before, yeah. and have faith in him. But this world destroyed any chance of having some kind of faith at all. Mm-hmm. I think in essence they're asking, how can I learn to love God and trust God and have faith in God when everything in this life I've done that with has failed me? I think that's what they're trying to say right there. Yeah. In light of a relationship too. Yeah. You know, you guys, like, I I came from a background, you know, of, of trauma, you know, of sexual abuse and other kinds of abuse. And I was that kid, you know, who found it hard to trust people, to even trust God, you know, to let God's love into my heart. And this person asking this question, you probably have a lot of walls in your life. Yeah. And that image of love, that picture of love in your life could have been distorted, you know, because of family, because of abuse, because of some type of brokenness. But what God has taught me is that people will always distort that image of love because we're human. But God came and gave us the perfect picture of love on the cross, um, which was him giving his life for us. And how to practically walk that out is, um, is that there's probably some healing that God needs to do in your heart. Like I believe that God has kept me single as long as he has. It's because I had huge trust issues. I probably would have sabotaged sabotaged any relationship God would have brought in my life. Mm. I believe that love um, in the area of people loving me always had strings attached to it. So what I had to do is I had to sit with God, you know, maybe talk to some of your leaders at church and ask them for a couple good books, you know, that you mm-hmm. could go through, get someone who can disciple you and practically walk you through, you know, this is what love is, you know. Francis Chan wrote an amazing book called Crazy Love. You know, it talks about God's love for us. I would recommend that book. Um, And it's going to be healing on just like, you know, kind of what was uh, 1 Corinthians 13? Mm -hmm. Read 1 Corinthians 13 because that is a definition of what love is. And even though love wasn't these things in your life, you know, that, you know, was distorted or whatever, you can understand what love is through God's word. But also give yourself grace because it is a process. But I want to encourage you that allow God to bring healing to your heart and your life and in your emotions. And I would encourage you to cut relationships with unhealthy people and pray that God would send healthy people in your life because God will use his people to model to us what love has looked like. And I'm a lot farther along than where I was, you know, years ago, but we're all in process. And so also when you enter into relationship, don't feel like you need to be perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're all a work in progress, but... Just maybe ask God, like, Lord, show me, teach me, send those people and, you know, inquire at your at your church, you know, for someone, you know, get plugged in. Yeah. The verse that comes to mind is in James um, chapter one, verse 16 and through 18. It says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. It means that God isn't trying to fake you out, that God isn't trying to pull a fast one on you. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. And this is personal for me, because the question being asked is, there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of damage in the back in the past that has happened to you, and it's affecting you in your relationship with God to even progress and a love relationship with God. But one thing that I had to come to terms with, even in Bible college, like learning who God was, God is not your dad. 
who your dad, your earthly dad was, how your earthly dad hurt you or how your earthly dad um, wasn't there for you or maybe abused you or even a relationship you were in, how that person abused your love or forsook you or just treated you like the absolute scum of the earth. We can't take that and then put that on God as if that's how God's going to treat me. Because when you start to do that, you don't open up yourself to how much God really loves you and who he is. Yeah. God is not going to cheat on you. God is not going to backstab you. Uh, God is not trying to pull a fast one on you. He, there is no malice or malicious intent in the heart of God for you. Mm-hmm. You have to understand that, that God, he is the father of lights. He, he's a good, good father. Mm-hmm. He loves you. His best intention for you is goes beyond before you were even born. Yeah. You have to understand if you're finding it hard to accept God's love, one, know that God is not like the people that hurt you. God is not someone that's going to hurt you. You'll go through crazy things in life. But also, if you want to learn how to truly love, you have to learn to be loved yes. by God. And that's what I would encourage that person yeah. is to understand how much God loves you mm-hmm. and be open to it. Yeah. And it and just take it's a step of faith. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. just going to believe. Yeah. And learn to be like being a lover of God is learning to be a recipient of love. Because once you get into a relationship with day, you can't give a love that you first haven't experienced. And what I love, you know, in Genesis, you know, when it says that Adam knew Eve, you know, that that word is yada. Mm -hmm. And it's like to know relationally and experientially. And that yada that they experienced, that relationally and experiential love was the same love that God first had with Adam. And he was like, now that you had that with Adam, now have that with Eve. In God's love, he wants to have with us is relational, it's experiential, it's intellectual, you know, it's like through the word, it's through all of these things. And I want to encourage you that, um, that he wants to have that with you. And be vulnerable. Yes. Be willing to be vulnerable. Yes. He already knows everything. Yeah. But you just have to take those steps to be open and start moving forward. Yeah. In a relationship with him first. If if you can't find it within yourself to have a relationship with God, you shouldn't have any business getting into yeah. any kind of relationship. Yeah. Um, let's get into uh, two more questions. Um, the next one was, also my friend is in a relationship and they both messed up in the past. I'm assuming a sinful mess up. I don't know. Both Christians but now are and have been working on pursuing relationship with God at another level. But she worries that she messed up the relationship all in one because of the past, and now it's affecting their future. So I think their past sins are, she's afraid that their wicked past is affecting their now future as they're pursuing God together. What do you say to that? Um, What I would definitely say is that God is a God of redemption. You know, that God can redeem, you know, mistakes that you've made in the past. But one thing that I want to ask you is I even, you know, I've had friends where they did cross boundaries physically in a relationship. You know, they they made mistakes. And there was a time where God was like, okay, I'm going to split you up for a time. And God had to do healing in their life. God had to mature them. God had to bring them under discipleship, you know, and and mentorship and get them planted in the house of God. And later on down the line, when they had mentors, you know, and people in their life that were like, okay, you guys are in a good place now. And God brought them back together that they were able to have a solid relationship. But, you know, if if that is your story, um, if you are if that is you, but that you're currently still struggling, I want to encourage you that there might need to be a time, you know, to break, you know, mm-hmm. for a time. And, um, and also I want to ask you, like, if this, is this the person God has for you? You know, like, because if this person is supposed to lead you to God, but is only leading you to, to sin, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it is, um, 
probably not leading you and probably not God's best for you. But if you are in a place where you are solid in your relationship with God, where you have moved forward, just know that God says that he has cast our sins, you know, as far as East is from the West, Yeah. that you are no longer under condemnation. Um, and write down Bible verses, look up Bible verses about shame and condemnation and just know that God sees you as his pure bride that God doesn't keep a record of wrongs. That's not what love is. And if you have that shame on, I want to encourage you that sometimes like fasting really helps, you know, to, to cover to shame. And that might be you not being on social media for a week and just taking that time to pray and say, God, break these bonds of shame over me and over our relationship to restore purity because God can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So this will be our last question for the evening. And the next question was, when someone who knows, and I want you to answer this, yeah. when someone who knows that they aren't mature in spirit and all, like everything we talked about, but they have someone who they have deep feelings for, how does one go about this? They're pretty much admitting I'm not mature, but I still have feelings for this person. What do I do? Sorry, can you repeat the whole question again? Like kind of how you worded it? It was when someone knows mm-hmm. that they aren't mature, yeah. like in spirit or mm-hmm. whatever, but they have feelings for someone. They have deep feelings. They want to be with someone. What do they do? Like like they're not mature enough to be in a relationship? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, you guys, like I would say, like, you know what? Like God gave us, you know, desires in our heart and – if you know that you're not in a place where you're ready to be in a relationship, you know, like it says in the book of song of Solomon, it says three times in the book of Solomon, Solomon is a great, you know, for like love, dating relationships, whatever. But it says to not awaken love before it's time. Mm. Um, but I want to ask you, you know, I like ask God, you know what God, like, um, you know, I have feelings for this person, but awaken a love for you in my life allow that my love for you to be greater than my desire for this person so that over time you god will begin to mature you and if you you know are supposed to be with that person later on down the line god will write that story but if not you're going to be at a place where you're okay because you will have already found that love yeah you know like in the lord yeah i would encourage the same thing like if if you it's a good thing to identify that you're not mature yeah but it's not a good thing when you try and jump the gun yes. and try and make it work yeah. with knowing that you're not mature to make this yeah. happen. What I would encourage you to do is to step up. Step up your game with your walk with God. Start taking your walk seriously because if you find a godly girl, she's not going to want to be with you. Yeah. And that's embarrassing. Yeah. And, and, and But that's a real thing. But at mm-hmm. the same time, that doesn't mean that God can't mature you. If mm-hmm. you can identify you're not mature in your faith, if you can identify you're not mature as a human being in finances or whatever it may be, then put the relationship on hold mm. and mature. Yes. Because why? Because marriage is the goal. Yes. And I wanted to end with this verse. And the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, This is something you can do if you want to mature as a female and as a male. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, give it your all. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Brotherly yes. kindness mm-hmm. and then love. Yeah. I know Sophia is big on this. She'll agree with me that why would you marry someone that's not your best friend? Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> I, th- I think it's important that you build a solid friendship, yes. godly friendship mm-hmm. with this person before you jump the gun Amen. and walk into marriage. But also make sure that you're maturing in Christ and you're maturing as a young man and maturing as a young woman as well. Yes. And so that's our time for this first episode of The Connect. 
with my good friend Christina Boudreau. I'm, Thank I'm, you so much for having me, dude. I'm, I was blessed. I was ministered to tonight. Yes. I'm so excited that you came out, and Thank I can't wait. Thank you so much wait. for having me. I'm blessed, and if they put me on the stage, they just scared I'm a kill. We bring the king to the world, dog. I don't even stress.